The Eagle's Claws by Ellis Parker Butler As Philo Gubb boarded the train for Riverbank, after recovering the silver loving cup from the interior of the petrified man, he cast a regretful glance backward. It was for Cyrilla. There was half a ton of her pink-white beauty, and her placid, cow-like expression touched an echoing chord in Philo Gubb's heart. Philo felt, however, that his admiration must be hopeless, for Cyrilla must earn a salary in keeping with her size and his income was too irregular and small to keep even a thin wife. Five hundred dollars was a large reward for a loving cup that cost not over thirty dollars, it is true, but Mr. Jonas Meadowbrook could afford to pay what he chose, and as he was passionately fond of golf and passionately poor at the game, and as this was probably the only golf prize he would ever win, he was justified in paying liberally, especially as this cup was not merely a tankard, but almost large enough to be called a tank. Detective Gubb hastened to the home of Mr. Meadowbrook, but when the door of that palatial house opened, the colored butler told Mr. Gubb that Mr. Meadowbrook was at the golf club, attending the annual banquet of the fifty worst duffers. Mr. Gubb started for the golf club. As he walked, he thought of Cyrilla, and he was at the gate of the golf club before he knew it. He walked up the path toward the clubhouse, but when halfway he stopped short all his detective instincts aroused. The windows of the clubhouse glowed with light, and sounds of merriment issued from them. But the cause of Philo Gubb's sudden pause was a head, silhouetted against one of the glowing windows. As Mr. Gubb watched, he saw the head disappear in the gloom below the window, only to reappear at another window. Mr. Gubb, following the directions as laid down in Lesson Four of the Correspondence Lessons, dropped to his hands and knees and crept silently toward the Paul Pry. When within a few feet of him, Mr. Gubb seated himself tailor fashion on the grass. As Philo sat on the damp grass, the man at the window turned his head, and Mr. Gubb noted with surprise that the stranger had none of the marks of a sodden criminal. The face was that of a respectably benevolent old German-American gentleman. Kindliness and good nature beamed from its lines. But at the moment the plump little man seemed in trouble. "'Good evening,' said Mr. Gubb. "'I presume you are taking an observation of the dinner party within the inside of the club.' The old gentleman turned sharply. "Yes," he said. "'I look at their people's eating and drinking.' Always I like to see dat, und such good eaters. Dot man mit der black beard, he was a splendid eater. Mr. Gubb raised himself to his knees and looked into the dining room. That, he said, is the Honorable Mr. Jonas Metterbrook, the wealthiest rich man in Riverbank. Metterbrook? Metterkrook, said the old German-American. Not Jones, eh? Not Jones, to my present personal knowledge at this time, said Philo Gubb. Not Jones, repeated the plumply benevolent-looking German-American. That was strange. You was sure he was not Jones? I'm quite almost positive upon that point of knowledge, said Philo Gubb. For I have under my arm a golf cup I am returning back to Mr. Meadowbrook, to receive five hundred dollars reward from him for. So, queried the stranger. Five hundred dollars? Und it is his cup? It is, said Philo Gubb. He raised the cup in his hand that the stranger might read the inscription, stating that the cup was Jonas Meadowbrook's. The light of the window made the engraving easy to read, but the old German-American first drew from his pocket a pair of gold-rimmed spectacles and adjusted them carefully on his nose. He then took the cup and moved closer to the window and read the inscription. Chess, chess he agreed, nodding his head several times, and then he smiled at Mr. Gubb, a broadly benevolent smile. Excuse me, he added, and with gentle deliberation he removed Mr. Gubb's hat. Just a minute, please, he continued, and with his free hand he felt gently on the top of Mr. Gubb's head. He turned Mr. Gubb's head gently to the right. So, he exclaimed, that was good. He raised the cup above his head and brought it down on top of Mr. Gubb's head, in the exact spot he had selected. 
For two moments Mr. Gubb made motions with his hands resembling those of a swimmer, and then he collapsed in a heap. The kindly-looking old German-American gentleman, seeing he was quite unconscious, tucked the golf cup under his own arm and waddled slowly down the path to the club gates. Ten minutes later a small automobile drove up and young Dr. Anson Briggs hopped out. Mr. Gubb was just getting to his feet, feeling the top of his head with his hand as he did so. "'Here,' said Dr. Briggs, "'you must not do that.' "'Why can't I do it?' Mr. Gubb asked crossly. "'It is my own personal head, and if I wish to desire to rub it, you are not concerned in the occasion whatever.' "'Oh, rub your head if you want to,' exclaimed the doctor. "'I say you must not stand up. A man that has just had a fit must not stand up.' "'Who had a fit?' asked Philo Gubb. "'You did,' said Dr. Briggs. "'I am told you had a very bad fit, and fell and knocked your head against the building. You're dazed. Lie down.' "'I prefer to wish to stand erect on my feet,' said Mr. Gubb firmly. "'Where's my cup?' "'What cup?' "'Who told you I was suffering from the symptoms of a fit?' demanded Philo Gubb. "'Why, a short, plump little German did,' said the doctor. "'He sent me here, and he gave me this to give to you.' The doctor held an envelope toward Mr. Gubb, and the detective took it and tore it open. By the light of the window he read, "'Received of J. Jones, golf cup, worth five hundred dollars. P. H. Schreckenheim.' Philo Gubb turned to Dr. Briggs. I am much obliged for the hastiness with which you came to relieve one you considered to think in trouble, doctor, he said. But fits are not in my line of sickness, which mainly is dyspeptic to date. Now, what is all this? asked the doctor suspiciously. What is that letter, anyway? It is a clue, said Philo Gubb which, connected with the bump on the top of the cranium of my skull, will no doubt land somebody into jail. So good evening, doctor." He picked his hat from the lawn, and in his most stately manner walked around the clubhouse and in at the door. Inside the clubhouse Mr. Gubb asked one of the waiters to call Mr. Meadowbrook, and Mr. Meadowbrook immediately appeared. As he came from the dining-room rapidly, the napkin he had tucked in his neck fell over his shoulder behind him and Mr. Meadowbrook, instead of turning around, bent backwards until he could pick up the napkin with his teeth, after which he resumed his normal upright position. "'Excuse me, Gubb,' he said. "'I didn't think what I was doing. Where's the cup?' The detective explained. He handed Mr. Meadowbrook the receipt that had been sent by Mr. Schreckenheim, and the moment Mr. Meadowbrook's eyes fell upon it he turned red. "'That infernal Dutchman!' he cried although Mr. Schreckenheim was not a Dutchman at all, but a German-American. I'll jail him for this. He stopped short. Gubb, he said, did that fellow tell you what his business was? He did not, said Philo Gubb. He failed to express any mention of it. That man, said Mr. Meadowbrook bitterly, is Schreckenheim, the greatest tattoo artist in the world. He is the king of them all. A connoisseur in tattooish art can tell a Schreckenheim as easily as a picture-dealer can tell a Corot. But no matter. Mr. Gubb, you are a detective, and I believe what is told detectives is held inviolable. Yes. You and all Riverbank see me an ordinary citizen. Wealthy, perhaps, but ordinary. As a matter of fact, I was once—he looked cautiously around—I was once a contortionist. I was once THE contortionist. And now I am a wealthy man. My wife left me because she said I was stingy, and she took my child, my only daughter. I have never seen either of them since. I have searched high and low, but I cannot find them. Mr. Gubb, I would give the man that finds my daughter, if she is alive, a thousand dollars." "'You don't object to my attempting to try?' said Philo Gubb. "'No,' said Mr. Jonas Meadowbrook. But that is not what I wish to explain. In my contortion act, Mr. Gubb, I was obliged to wear the most expensive silk tights. Wiggling on the floor destroys them rapidly. I had a happy thought. I was known as the Man-Serpent. Could I not save all expenses of tights by having myself tattooed so that my skin would represent scales? Look!" Mr. Meadowbrook pulled up his cuff and showed Mr. Gubb his arm. 
It was beautifully tattooed in red and blue, like the scales of a cobra. The cost, continued Mr. Meadowbrook, was great. Herr Schreckenheim worked continuously on me, and when he reached my manly chest I had a brilliant thought. I would have tattooed upon it an American eagle. Imagine the enthusiasm of an audience when I stood straight, spread my arms, and showed that noble emblem of our nation's strength and freedom. I told Herr Schreckenheim, and he set to work. When, and the contract price, by the way, for doing that eagle was five hundred dollars, when the eagle was about completed, I said to Herr Schreckenheim, Of course you will do no more eagles. More eagles? he said questioningly. On other men, I said, I want to be the only man with an eagle on my chest. I am doing an eagle on another man now, he said. I was angry at once. I jumped from the table and threw on my clothes. Cheater, I cried. Not another spot or dot shall you make on me. Go. I will never pay you a cent. He was very angry. It is a contract, he cried. Five hundred dollars you owe me. I owe it to you when the job is complete, I declared. That was the contract. Is this job complete? Where are the eagle's claws? I'll never pay you a cent. We had a lot of angry words. He demanded that I give him a chance to put the claws on the eagle. I refused. I said I would never pay. He said he would follow me to the end of the world and collect. He said he would do those eagle claws if he had to do them on my infant daughter. I dared him to touch the child. And now, said Mr. Meadowbrook, he has taken the golf cup I value at five hundred dollars. He has won. At the mention of the threat regarding the child, Philo Gubb's eyes opened wide, but he kept silent. Gubb, said Mr. Meadowbrook suddenly, I'll give you a thousand dollars if you can recover my poor child. The deteckative profession is full of complicity of detail, said Mr. Gubb, and the impossible is quite possible when put in the right hands. The cub— Bother the cub, said Mr. Meadowbrook carelessly. I want my child. I'll give ten thousand dollars for my child, Gubb." With difficulty could Philo Gubb restrain his eagerness to depart. He had a clue. Ordinarily Mr. Gubb would have taken any disguise that seemed to him best suited for the work in hand. But now he was going to see and be seen by Cirilla. Mr. Gubb ran down the list. Number seven, card sharp. Number nine, minister of the gospel. Number twelve, butcher. Number sixteen, negro hack driver. Number seventeen, Chinese laundryman. Number twenty, cowboy. Philo Gubb paused there. He would be a cowboy, for it was a jaunty disguise. Chaps, sombrero, spurs, buckskin gloves, holsters, and pistols. Blue shirt, yellow hair, stubby mustache. He donned the complete disguise, put his street garments in a suitcase, and viewed himself in his small mirror. He highly approved of the disguise. He touched his cheeks with red to give himself a healthy outdoor appearance. Early the next morning, before the earliest merchants had opened their shops, Philo Gubb boarded the train for West Higgins, for it was there the world's greatest combined shows were to appear. The few sleepy passengers did not open their eyes. The conductor, as he took Mr. Gubb's ticket, merely remarked, Joining the show at West Higgins? and passed on. Boys were already gathering on the West Higgins station platform when the train pulled in, and they cheered Mr. Gubb, thinking him part of the show. This greatly increased the difficulty of Mr. Gubb's detective work. He had hoped to steal unobserved to the circus grounds, but a dozen small boys immediately attached themselves to him, running before him and whooping with joy. "'Boys,' said Mr. Gubb sternly, "'I wish you to run away and play elsewhere than in front of me continuously all the time.' And they cheered, because he had spoken. Only the glad news that the circus trains had reached town finally dragged them reluctantly away. Detective Gubb hurried to the circus grounds. The cook tent was already up, and the grub tent was being put up. Presently the sideshow tent was up, and the big top rising. It was not until nine o'clock, however, that the sideshow ladies and gentlemen began to appear, and when they arrived they went at once to the grub tent and seated themselves at the table. 
From a corner of the Big Top's side wall, Detective Gubb watched them. "'Look there, dearie,' said Cyrilla suddenly to Princess Zozo. "'Don't that cowboy look like Mr. Gubb that was at Bardville and got the golf cup?' "'It don't look like him,' said Princess Zozo. "'It is him. Why don't you ask him to come over and help at the eats? You seemed to like him yesterday.' "'I thought he was a real gentlemanly gentleman, dearie, if that's what you mean.' said Cyrilla, and raising her voice she called to Mr. Gubb. For a moment he hesitated, and then he came forward. We knowed you the minute we seen you, Mr. Gubb. Come and sit in beside me and have some breakfast if you ain't dined. I thought you went home last night. You ain't after no more criminals, are you? There are variously many ends to the deteckative business, said Mr. Gubb, as he seated himself beside Cyrilla. I'm upon a most important case at the present time." Cyrilla reached for her fifth boiled potato, and as her arm passed Mr. Gubb's face he thrilled. He had not been mistaken. Upon that arm was a pair of eagle's claws, tattooed in red and blue. How little these had meant to him before, and how much they meant now! "'I presume you don't hardly ever long for a home in one place, Miss Cyrilla he began, with his eye fixed on her arm just above the elbow. "'Well, believe me, dearie,' said Cyrilla, "'you don't want to think that just because I travel with a sideshow I don't long for the refinements of a true home, just like other folks. Some folks think I'm easy to see through and that I ain't nothing but fat and appetite. But they've got me down wrong, Mr. Gubb. I was unfortunate in getting lost from my father and mother when a babe. But many is the time I've said to Zozo, I've got a refined strain in my nature, haven't I, Zozo?" You say it every time we begin to rag you about falling in love with every new thin man you see, said Princess Zozo. You said it last night when we was joshing you about Mr. Gubb here. Cyrilla colored, but Mr. Gubb thrilled joyously. Just the same, dearie, Cyrilla said to Princess Zozo. I've got myself listed right when I say I got a refined nature. I've got all the instincts of a real society lady, and sometimes it irks me awful not to be able to let myself loose and bant like." Pant? asked Mr. Gubb. Bant was the word I used, Mr. Gubb, Cyrilla replied. Maybe you wouldn't guess it, looking at me shoveling in the edibles this way, but eating food is the cruelest thing I have to do. It jars me something terrible. Yes, dearie, what I long for day and night is a chance to take my place in the social stratums I was born for, and bant off the fat like other social ladies is doing right along. I don't eat food because I like it, Mr. Gubb, but because a lady in a profession like mine has got to keep fatted up. My outside may be fat, Mr. Gubb, but I got a soul inside of me as skinny as any fashionable lady would care to have and as soon as possible I'm going to quit the road and bant off six or seven hundred pounds. Would you believe it possible that I ain't dared to eat a pickle for over seven years because it might start me on the thinward road?" "'I presume to suppose,' said Mr. Gubb politely, "'that if you was to be offered a home that was rich with wealth, and I was to take you there and place you beside your parental father, would you refuse?' Mr. Gubb awaited the reply with eagerness. He tried to remain calm, but in spite of himself he was nervous. "'Watch me,' said Cyrilla. "'If you could show me a nook like that, you couldn't hold me in this show business with a tent stake and a bull tackle. But that's a rosy dream. "'You ain't got a locket with the photo of your mother's picture into it?' asked Mr. Gubb. "'No,' said Cyrilla. "'My pa and ma was unknown to me.' I dare say they got sick of hearing me bawl and left me on a doorstep. The first I knew of things was that I was traveling with a show, representing a newborn babe in an incubator machine. I was incubated up to the time I was five years old, and got too long to go into the glass case. But someone was your guardian in charge of you, no doubt?" asked Gubb. I had forty of them, dearie, said Cyrilla. Whenever money run low, they quit because they couldn't get paid on Saturday night. Ha, ah, said Mr. Gubb, and does the name Jones bring back the memory of any remembrance to you? 
No, Mr. Gubb, said Cyrilla regretfully, seeing how eager he was. It don't. In that state of the case of things, said Mr. Gubb, I've got to go over to that wagon pole and sit down and think a while. I've got a certain clue I've got to think over and make sure it leads right, and if it does, I'll have something important to say to you. The wagon pole in question was attached to a canvas wagon nearby, and Detective Gubb seated himself on it and thought. The sideshow ladies and gentlemen, having finished, entered the sideshow tent, with the exception of Cyrilla, who remained to finish her meal. She ate a great deal at meals, before meals, and after meals. Mr. Gubb, from his seat on the wagon pole, looked at Cyrilla thoughtfully. He had not the least doubt that Cyrilla was the lost daughter of Mr. Jones, or Meadowbrook, as he now called himself. The German-American tattoo artist had sworn to complete the eagle by putting its claws on Mr. Jones's daughter, if need be, and here were the claws on Cyrilla's arm. But just as it is desirable at times to have a handwriting expert identify a bit of writing, Mr. Gubb felt that if he could prove that the claws tattooed on Cyrilla's arm were the work of Mr. Schreckenheim, his case would be complete. He longed for Mr. Schreckenheim's presence, but lacking that, he had a happy idea. Mr. Enderbury, the tattooed man of the sideshow, should be a connoisseur, and would perhaps be able to identify the eagle's claws. Leaving Cyrilla still eating, Mr. Gubb entered the sideshow tent. Mr. Enderbury, seated on a blue property case, was engaged in biting the entire row of fingernails on his right hand, and a frown creased his brow. He was enwrapped by a long purple bathrobe, which tied closely about his neck. As he caught sight of Mr. Gubb, he started slightly and doubled his hand into a fist, but he immediately calmed himself and assumed a nonchalant air. As a matter of fact, Mr. Enderbury led a dog's life. For years he had loved Cyrilla devotedly, but he was so bashful he had never dared to confess his love to her, and year after year he saw her smile upon one thin man after another. Now it was Mr. Lonergan, again it was Mr. Winterberry, or it was Mr. Gubb, or Smith, or Jones, or Doe. But for Mr. Enderbury she seemed to have nothing but contempt. Mr. Enderbury had first seen her when she was posing in the infant incubator, and had loved her even then, for he was twenty when she was but five. The coming of a new rival always affected him as the coming of Mr. Gubb had, but for good reason he hated Mr. Gubb worse than any of the others. "'Excuse me for begging your pardon,' said Mr. Gubb, but in the deteckative business questions have to be asked. Have you ever chanced to happen to notice some tattoo work upon the arm of Miss Cyrilla of the sideshow? I have, said Mr. Edinbury shortly. A pair of eagle's claws, said Mr. Gubb. Can you tell me from your knowledge and belief if the work there done was the work of Mr. Herr Schreckenheim? I can tell you if I want to, said Mr. Edinbury. What do you want to know for? If those claws are the work of Mr. Herr Schreckenheim, said Mr. Gubb, I am prepared to offer to Miss Cyrilla her daughterly place in a home of wealth at Riverbank, Iowa. If those claws are Schreckenheim claws, Miss Cyrilla is the daughter of Mr. Jonas Meadowbrook of the said Berg, beyond the question of a particle of doubt. Mr. Enderbury looked at Mr. Gubb with surprise. That's not, he began, and if Schreckenheim did those claws you'll take Cyrilla away from this show, forever?" he asked. I will, said Philo Gubb, if she desires to wish to go. Then I have nothing whatever to say, said Mr. Enderbury, and he shut his mouth firmly, nor would he say more. Do you desire to wish me to understand that they are not the work of Mr. Herr Schreckenheim? persisted Mr. Gubb. I have nothing to say said Mr. Enderbury. I consider that conclusive circumstantial evidence that they are, said Detective Gubb, and he clanked out of the sideshow. Cyrilla was still seated at the grub table, finishing her meal, and Mr. Gubb seated himself opposite her. As delicately as he could, he told of Jonas Meadowbrook and his lost daughter, of the home of wealth that awaited that daughter, and finally of his belief that Cyrilla was that daughter. 
it was clear that Cyrilla was quite willing to take up a life of refinement and dieting if she was given an opportunity such as Mr. Gubb was able to offer in the name of Jonas Meadowbrook. And this being so, he questioned her regarding the eagle's claws. Mr. Gubb, she said, I wish to die on the spot if I know how I got them claws tattooed on me. If you ask me, I'll say it was the mystery of my life. They've been on me since I was a little girl, no bigger than— Why, who is that? Mr. Gubb turned his head quickly, but he was not in time to see a plump, good-natured-looking little German-American slip quickly out of sight behind the cook tent. Neither did he see the glitter of the sun on a large silver golf cup the plump German-American carried under his arm. But the German-American had recognized Mr. Gubb, even through his disguise of a cowboy. "'No matter,' said Zorilla. "'But these claws have been on my arm since I was a wee little girl, Mr. Gubb. I always thought they was a trademark of a hospital.' "'I was not knowingly aware that hospitals had trademarks,' said Mr. Gubb. Maybe they don't, said Zorilla. But when I was a small child I had an accident, and had to be took to the hospital, and it wasn't until after that that anybody saw the eagle's claws on me. I considered that maybe it was like the mark the laundry puts on a handkerchief it has laundered. I don't know much about the manners of the ways of hospitals, admitted Mr. Gubb, and that may be so, but I have another idea. Did you ever hear of Mr. Herr Schreckenheim? Only that Mr. Enderbury is always cross on the days of the month that he gets Mr. Schreckenheim's statements of money due. Mr. Schreckenheim is the man that tattooed Mr. Enderbury so beautiful. But poor Mr. Enderbury has never been able to pay him in full." Philo Gubb arose. I am going to telegraph Mr. Meadowbrook to come on to West Higgins immediately by the 3 p.m. afternoon train, he said and you will meet him as your paternal father and arrange to make your home with him as soon as you desire to wish it at five o'clock that afternoon mr meadowbrook escorted by mr gubb entered the sideshow tent the lady and gentleman freaks were resting before evening grub and all were gathered around cyrilla's platform for the news that she was to leave the show to enter a home of wealth and refinement had spread quickly cyrilla herself was in tears now that the time had come, she was loath to part from her kind companions. "'I tell you, Mr. Gubb,' Mr. Meadowbrook said, as they entered the sideshow, "'if you have indeed found my daughter, you have made me a happy man. You cannot know how lonesome my life has been. Now, which is she?' "'She is the female lady in the pink satin dress on the platform,' said Mr. Gubb. Mr. Meadowbrook looked toward Cyrilla and gasped. "'Why!' That, that's the fat woman! That's the fat woman of the sideshow!" he exclaimed. I thought I, why, my daughter wouldn't be a fat woman in a sideshow. But she is, said Mr. Gubb. Great Scott! exclaimed Mr. Meadowbrook. For years Mr. Meadowbrook had retained a memory of his daughter as he had seen her last, a tender babe in long clothes. As he rode toward West Higgins, however, he had thought about his daughter, and he had revised his conception of her. She was older now, of course, and he had finally settled the matter by deciding that she would be a dainty slip of a girl, probably a tightrope walker or one of the toe dancers in the grand spectacle, or perhaps even engaged as the ten-thousand-dollar beauty. But a fat lady? Yes, said a voice suddenly. You bet I was here. And I want my money. Years I have been collecting dot bill, and still you owe me. Now I come and you pay me all what you owe me, or I make trouble." The voice came from outside the tent, and with surprising agility Detective Gubb dived under the platform and wriggled under the canvas wall. "'I don't owe you a cent,' exclaimed the voice of Mr. Enderbury. "'I've paid you for every bit of tattoo I have on me.' Seven hundred dollars was their contract.' cried the voice of Herr Schreckenheim. Und ten dollars is due me yet. I want it. Well, you'll keep on wanting it, said Mr. Enderbury's voice. Look here. Look at my chest. There's the eagle you did on me. Do you see any claws on it? No, you don't. Well, I'm not going to pay for claws that are not on me. No, sir. Claws? I do some claws on you, don't I, when I do that eagle? 
asked the German-American. "'Yes, but they're not on me now, are they?' asked Mr. Enderbury. "'You can go and collect from the person that has them. What do I care for her now? She's going to quit the circus business. I've paid for all the tattoo that's on me. You go and collect ten dollars for those claws from Cyrilla.' "'And how does she get those claws on her?' asked Herr Schreckenheim shrewdly. "'I'll tell you how,' said Mr. Enderbury. "'You remember when Griggs and Barton's circus burned down years ago? Well, Cyrilla was burned in that fire, burned on the arm, and they took her to a hospital and her arm wouldn't heal. So somebody had to furnish some skin for a skin-grafting job, and I did it. The piece they took had those claws on it. That's what happened.' I gave those eagle's claws to cure her, and I've hung around her all these years like a faithful dog, and she don't care a hang for me, and now she's going away. Go and collect for those claws from her. I haven't got them. She's going to be rich. She can pay you." Simultaneously there was an exclamation from Mr. Meadowbrook, a cry from Cyrilla, and a short, sharp yell from outside the tent. Mr. Gubb entered, spurs first, creeping backward under the canvas. As he backed from under the platform, it was observed that he held a shoe, about number eight size, in one hand, and that a foot was in the shoe, and the foot on a leg, and the leg on a short, plump, elderly German-American who yelled as he was dragged into the tent on his back. In one hand of the German-American was a large silver golf cup with a deep dent on one side. As Mr. Gubb arose to his feet, still holding the German-American tattoo artist's foot in his hand, he said, Mr. Meadowbrook, the deteckative business is not always completely satisfactory in all kinds of respects, and it looks as if it appeared that the daughter I found for you is somebody else's. But if you will look at the other end of the assaulter and batterer I have in hand, you will see that I have recovered the silver golf cup trophy once again for the second time. And that, said Mr. Meadowbrook, as he took the cup from the German-American's hand, is remarkable work. The ordinary detective is usually satisfied to recover stolen property once, but you have recovered this cup twice. The motto of my deteckative business, said Mr. Gubb modestly, is perfection, no matter how many times. Mr. Gubb might have said more, but he was interrupted by Princess Zozo, the snake charmer who had walked around Cyrilla and unhooked two of the hooks at the top of Cyrilla's low-necked gown. Look! she exclaimed, and she pointed to a second pair of eagle's claws tattooed between Cyrilla's shoulder blades. Without a word, Mr. Meadowbrook took five hundred dollars from his purse and handed them to Mr. Schreckenheim. That pays you for the cup, he said, and then, turning to Cyrilla, come to my arms, my long-lost daughter. After Cyrilla had hugged her father affectionately, Mr. Gubb and the freaks laid him on the ground, and by fanning him vigorously were able to bring him back to life. Mr. Meadowbrook's first act upon opening his eyes was to hold out his hand to Mr. Gubb. "'Thank you, Gubb,' he panted. "'It's a big price, but I'll keep my word. The ten thousand dollars shall be yours.' Into ordinary circumstances, said Mr. Gubb gravely, ten thousand dollars would be a largely big price to pay for recovering back a lost daughter, Mr. Meadowbrook. But into the present case it don't amount to more than ten dollars per pound of daughter, which ain't a largely great rate per pound. End of The Eagle's Clause by Ellis Parker Butler